Hello, everybody. <clears throat> this is Professor Hassey. It's Friday, April 7th. This is our week one update video for the weekend. <clears throat> and we have this every week in our course. We have a lecture video every Monday, and this week it happened to be on Tuesday. Apologize for that. And a weekend update video <clears throat> highlighting the week's key topics or assignments for the week posted every Friday. A couple of administrative things to do. Right now, I have uh, recorded your grade and your postings for the discussion forum for this week, where I ask you to give me a little biography about, your, about yourself and to select a company and tell me that company's beta. And I have reviewed those and replied and uh, posted your grades for that. If you have yet to do that, please do so and complete it by this Sunday at midnight, April 9th. So that's all done. If you want to see that you have a grade, if you look here on the front page of your Blackboard site, you'll see a section called Report Card. And it'll give you our class, Business 630, uh, CRN 111 and 2626. If there should be a grade there next to it, if you, your grades have been posted. Every week, whenever I give a give, post a grade for your work, be it a, a discussion forum, be it a case study, be it a paper, uh, that cumulative grade in your class will show up on the front section of your Blackboard. Just click on that grade and you can get the details of what makes up that cumulative grade average. So if you're ever interested, you just sign on the Blackboard, you look at that, and you'll see the current grade in, your, in the class up to date right on the front page, and you can click on that grade to get information and specifics about that grade. And then you can send me an email or contact me uh, at our student hours on Tuesday and Thursday evenings from 6 to 8 if you have any questions or concerns about your grade. <clears throat> A final administrative task now is I have posted to the student discussion forum for our class a schedule to meet the professor. Uh, every online course that I have, the second week of the class, I like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with every student in the class during that second week for five or 10, 15 minutes to just go over the course, make sure you're comfortable with the course, if you have any issues with the course, if you have any issues with your technology, if you have any issues with your time management for this class. Remember, this is an advanced MBA class in eight weeks. Not easy. So you have to make sure you budget uh, time management to do this class and keep up with it if you want to get a good grade. So if you go to the student discussion forum and see the student professor meeting for week two, you'll see a schedule. Monday through Thursday of next week, times that I have allocated to meet with you. So your job as a student in the next uh, 72 hours is to select a day and a time that fits your schedule, open up the forum by clicking on the forum and creating a thread. And when you create a thread, you're going to in call it, the subject will be my appointment. And then you will, in that thread, give me the date and time that you have selected and then hit submit because only one student can get each time. So what I'll do once I receive that uh, selection by you, I will go back into the discussion forum and put your name next to the appropriate time. So future students who log in and wanna find a time and a date will see that those specific times and dates are already occupied by fellow students and you can select another one. So that's what I want you to do probably over this weekend. Uh, for heading into week two is select a time next Monday evening, next Tuesday evening, next Thursday afternoon or Thursday evening that you can spend a couple of minutes with me just a one on one to go over our class and get to know me a little bit better. Online, one of the worst things about online is you you're kind of like dealing with a professor who's out there in Internet land that you never see or hear much from. That's never going to be the case with me because you're going to get sick of my videos after a while. But it's good to keep in touch and have some communication and engagement with your professor. And I want the same back from you. I want you to feel comfortable with uh, 
talking to me and asking questions and that sort of thing. So if any of these times and dates do not fit into your schedule, we will select the time probably for next weekend, the weekend of April 15th or 16th, uh, to fit into my schedule and your schedule for maybe we can find that appropriate time. But I really would like you to concentrate on these four day, three days in the coming week and see if we can get together. So that's your task for this weekend. If you have yet to finish the discussion form of week one, you need to do that. But I need you to do this to select a date and time to meet with me. This is for a grade. If you do not participate in this professor discussion meeting, you will lose 5% of your course grade. So make sure you find the times allocated, uh, allocated so you can meet with me. And it's important to establish that communication with the student and the professor. So that's something you need to do uh, this weekend to prepare for that. And if you have any questions or concern about that, you know where to find me. Another thing I would like you to do this weekend is to read this Harvard Business Review article that I have in week one uh, articles to review, Efficient, Chaotic, What is the New Finance? I'd like you to take the time this weekend to read this article because we're gonna discuss it in our week two topics. Uh, please uh, take a gander at it. This is gonna relate to your case number one, which will be posted next week. And so I would like you to read this article and uh, put it in your memory bank or highlight uh, because we'll be looking and discussing this article later on in our course. So in uh, it's in your week one work, uh, this article, you download it, Harvard Business Review, Efficient, Chaotic, What is the New Finance? Please take a look and read this article uh, this weekend. One of the key topics of this first week, besides getting uh, up to speed on the infrastructure of Blackboard, especially if you're a, a new user of the Blackboard platform, and also uh, telling me a little bit about yourself and also selecting a company to track uh, or follow throughout our course. And finally, to set a meeting time uh, in the week two to, to meet with me and talk about the course individually, is risk and return. A key part of finance and investment is to understand the risk and the and its effects on return uh, in uh, in corporate finance, because uh, if you are uh, have a high degree of risk, uh, that means your chances of success are reduced. And as an investor, as a financial manager, to understand those risks are very important to strategic decision making in corporate finance. What is investment risk? Investment risk is exposure to the chance of earning less than expected. The greater the chance of return of a return far below the expected return, the greater risk. So let's, let's say I want to go and invest in Apple Computer. And I expect a 20% return this year from Apple Computer because I've read over the last 10 years, Apple historically has averaged 20 to 25% return a year. Historically, average is the key there. Lately, they have not been doing that. So if I go into 2023 expecting as an investor a 20% return on my Apple stock, that's going to be fairly risky. Why? Because the beta or the historical review of those returns in the market is rather high. Let's say 1.3 is the beta of, in other words, of, of Apple. In other words, the risk of accepting that 20% return is pretty great because Apple has not been doing that over the last year or so. So your risk is very high. Now, our, as an investor, you have to go in with your eyes wide open. Yeah, it's one thing to say, I want a 20% return. It's another thing to say, what's gonna happen if you don't get that return? Are you gonna be upset, yell, yell at somebody, sue somebody? No, going into the investment because you realize or knew the high risk of that possibility of that return not happening, it's up to you to swallow that and accept it. So that's an important thing, especially in financial management. Understand the risk beforehand of an investment. 
And what are the chances of you getting a 20% return or a 10% return or a, a loss? What is that distribution of the likelihood of that's happening? And this goes back to our days of statistics and statistical studies of how you deviate from the average of the company to what is going to happen. And it's called probability distribution. For example, in this probability distribution curve, if any of you are familiar with statistics analysis, here is a average or here is some returns, the probabilities of those occurring at different levels. And for this company, the average or the expected return is 6%. That's the top of the curve. As the curve goes out, 10% return, 20% return, 30% return, notice the probability or the dis distribution of that occurring decreases from the expected of 6%. And the same the other way, losses, negative 10% loss, negative 20% loss. So to understand the probability distribution of a return and the likelihood that it will happen, as the farther you get out in that curve, the greater the risk of that, of that expected return is not going to happen. And that's what beta analysis is. The beta of a company is the likelihood that you'll match the average returns of the market. The average return of the market is an average or a beta of 1.0. And in this case, that would be 6%. And if you're, if you're expecting a 20% return off this company, that means as you can see, the risk and the probability that will happen is severely decreasing. And that's what beta is. The beta is comparing the overall historical return of that particular company going out four to five quarters, four to five years quarterly, compared to the return of the S&P or the 500 or the stock market. How you deviate from that average in the market. The market beta is one. If any beta of your particular company is over one, that means it has not as consistent of giving returns to match the market over the prior four or five years. That's a rolling average. Now, does that mean it's a bad investment? No, it just means it's not consistent with the market. It goes up and down. And if your beta is under one, then it, you have outperformed the market in consistency. Your company has been even better and lower risk because it meets its goals and expectations of return every quarter. That's why the risk-free interest rate, the 10-year treasury yield, is a beta of zero. There's no risk. That is a guaranteed amount. It does not fluctuate with the market. Whereas if you invest in Apple Computer, that is not guaranteed that you'll get 20% return, even 6% return. It's not guaranteed. It's due to the performance of Apple Computer. So that's why the beta for corporations is significantly higher than zero because zero, there's no risk. You know exactly what you're going to get when you invest in a 10-year treasury bond. And that's... That's what we call risk. And as a financial manager, you have to be aware of your risk in your markets because if you have a high risk, a high beta, a, high, a poor credit rating, it's going to be difficult to attract investors who are willing to take that risk. The only way they will take that risk is if you give them higher returns. And that means higher cost. So as that curve indicated, the as you deviate from the expected or the average uh, return of a stock, the standalone risk is that risk of each asset gets higher. Standard deviation measures the dispersion of possible outcomes. So in that curve, as you disperse out over a possible other types of return off that stock, the risk grows higher because it's deviating from the average standard deviation. Investments with large deviations have more risk. High risk doesn't mean you should reject the investment, but you should know that the risk before investing. If you have a company with a high beta, 
doesn't mean you're gonna it's gonna lose money. It's just you need to be aware that the historical review of your company shows that they're very inconsistent in achieving their expected returns. And the only way you should stick with that company is if at the higher the risk, the company is going to try to get you a greater return to compensate you for that risk. So not to get too technical, but this is not a statistics class. I will never ask you to compare or find or calculate beta. You don't have to worry about that. Beta is a given number that you find from market analysis. But just an understanding of what beta is, is, is a key to understanding what beta plays in our investment analysis. Beta is what is considered the standard deviation of a portfolio of your particular cost stock P1 to the market standard deviation divided by the standard deviation or the risk over the overall market. That formula gives you beta. And as I said earlier, the average of the market is one. The average of risk-free for risk-free investments is zero. Your beta for whatever company that you have posted to the discussion forum, I ask you to find the beta. If your beta was over one for the company you selected, that means your company is not a poorly managed company, is not a loser. It's just that they have been a little bit more inconsistent in matching the returns on a quarter by quarter basis for their projected returns on investment by that company. That's all it measures. It measures the impact of, the, of your stock to the overall market standard deviation or market return over a period of time. So naturally, if you're going to invest in a, in a stock in a company as an investor, or if you're a, a treasurer or a financial manager or a CFO of a corporation, you want to always know what your current risk is in the market so you can go and out and attract investors. Even if you're not trying to issue any more stock, if you want to borrow money, Financial institutions, banks, bond, bond funds, pension funds, all look at the risk of your company by beta. So even though you're not issuing equity, if you're going to borrow money, still risk is a key component to determine what investors will be willing to give you money for investment. And one of the uh, standards or return for risk is called the risk-free interest rate. We've talked about that. It's the 10-year return on investment for a 10-year United States Treasury yield. Investors require a return for with risk, which is the extra return above the risk-free rate that investors require to induce them to invest in stock. So if I'm going to invest in a 10-year Treasury yield, as of Friday, that was paying me roughly 3.3% return every year for that investment. But if I want to invest in Apple computer, 3.3% ain't going to be right. I want a lot higher than that. The beta of Apple computer measures the risk of me trying to go out and get the standard rate of return for Apple computer, which currently is about 8, 8.5%. 8 the beta indicates whether that is risky or not. The higher over one, the greater the risk. Doesn't mean that Apple's not going to obtain that return. It just means the chances or the likelihood of it happening. And you as an investor should be aware of that. And you as a financial manager or a CFO have to understand that how, what, how can we make our company more attractive for capital is we want to reduce that beta over time of our company. How do you reduce beta? You make your company more attractive to returns, meaning less debt, meaning more profits, cash flow, and that will that's financial management. So it all kind of plays hand in hand in, in your return is company management and investor expected returns. And we talked about this in our Monday lecture. One of the key measurements of this required return and risk in the market is the capital asset pricing model. The in other words, it's a measurement 
of the risk of your company stock compared to the market. The risk in the market is RPM, the market premium, which is the current return of, of the market, the overall stock market, usually measured by the S Standard & Poor's 500 re return, minus the risk-free rate. And you take that market premium, the market return minus the risk-free rate and multiply it times the current risk of your particular stocks, beta I. So if your company you looked up in your discussion form this week had a beta of 1.22, you can determine the expected return based on the current market risk of that company today by comparing that, taking that beta and multiplying it times the risk-free rate minus their market premium and get that market return rate, and you can determine the risk in the market. And this is one of the things you'll be doing in your case number one when you take a look at the credit and the risk of your particular companies that you selected in week one. What that means is you're going to take the the required return is going to equal the risk-free interest rate plus that market premium we just talked about times the beta of your company. That entire formula equals the expected return of your investment, your company in today's market. The risk-free interest rate plus the market premium times the risk or the beta of your company. So naturally, the higher the beta, the greater the risk and the return. The lower the beta, the lower the risk and required return. Another concept of this capital asset pricing model is another way of saying it is the cost of equity. It's the cost of equity. What your company needs to provide as a return on the stock investment in your business. Capital asset pricing model equals cost of equity equals expected return based on the risk of your company in the market. Okay, let's look at a real example of determining this capital asset pricing model, the cost of equity or the required expected return. Let's take a company and I'm going to select General Electric. So I'm going to type in here General Electric. I am Yahoo Finance, which I feel is the most easiest user-friendly way of getting any financial data. It's not 100% accurate, but it's a quick and easy way of getting financial information about any publicly traded company in the market. So I'm going to type in General Electric, and here it is right here, and I'm going to bring up General Electric. And this is a summary schedule, which gives the closing stock price last Friday of the company. But more important, it gives a lot of financial information. And here's one that I'm in particular interest of. It's the beta of General Electric. The beta is a five-year monthly average over time, over five years of the risk of General Electric to the market. Remember, the market is 1.0. So beta of General Electric currently currently is 1.19, which is, means it's a little bit more riskier than the market. Okay, now that I know the beta is 1.19, what is the market risk or required return of General Electric today in the market? So we'll go to So we'll go to a spreadsheet and let's type in General Electric beta currently is 1.19, okay? The current risk-free interest rate as of the close of business today, fr uh, Friday, the closing 10-year treasury yield was roughly about 3.45%, okay? That's a beta, or that's a beta equaling zero. The current S&P 500, market return is currently 9.15%. That's with a beta of one. All right. What is General Electric's expected return? Or in other word, cost of equity.
All right. Well, let's do the capital asset pricing model, which equals the expected return. The expected return or R is equal to the risk free interest rate plus the market premium, which is the market rate minus the risk free rate. And that number is multiplied times the beta of General Electric. All right, let's do the math. So the risk-free rate is currently 3.45%. We're gonna add that to the market premium, which is 9.15% minus the risk-free rate of 3.45%. And that number is gonna be multiplied by the G uh, beta of General Electric, which is 1.19, all right? So let's do the arithmetic. First of all, let's do the market premium. If we take nine, nine point two five and minus three point four five, what do we get? Let's make that a decimal. We get six percent. Three nine. Oh, that's not right. Nine point two five minus three point four five. I typed it in wrong. There we go. Five point eight percent. Okay, so we're now going to do equals 3.45 times 5.80 times 1.19. And that's incorrect. I did the formula wrong. Let's do that again. Should have done this beforehand. <clears throat> Got a, I, I was short a uh, parenthesis, 3.45 plus, oops, plus 5.80. Two five minus three point four five another parentheses times one point one nine. That should work. Be nice if I put an equal sign there. Oops, now what did I do? Okay, I'm doing dealing with a newer version of Excel here and I wasn't used to the, to the uh, formula. So here we go, let's try this again. So the expected return is the first free rate 3.45 plus parentheses, the market premium, which we calculate as 5.80 times the beta of GE 1.19, put that in parentheses, and we get 10.352%. That's the expected return based on the risk of General Electric that an investor would want today if they would invest in General Electric stock. They would expect in the next year to get a 10.352% return. Does that mean they're gonna get it? Who knows? It's up to General Electric and it's up to the market. But based on zero risk, average risk, and the risk of the company, an investor should expect to get a 10.352%. Now, if an investor Monday morning calls their broker and says, do you think General Electric's gonna get to 10.352% return in the next year? And the broker says, I don't think so, they won't buy. But if you take a look at the financials and the expectations, remember, every public corporation in, the, in America has to disclose every quarter their expected earnings for the next 12 months. So if General Electric in their expectations say, yeah, I think we can make 11% next year, well, then people might be attracted based on the risk in the market of General Electric to buy that stock. If they don't think they're going to make those returns, they won't buy. If they already own the stock, 
and they don't think those returns are going to be met, they'll sell the stock. If they want to buy more of the stock because they expect the returns to, to be there and, may, and General Electric will achieve them, they'll buy more of the stock. Welcome to the stock market. But the risk is the key measurement here. The risk of the beta of General Electric, which is 1.19, compared to the market risk of 1.0 and the risk-free rate of zero. So if I, if I am definitely afraid of losing money, I'm going to buy the United States Treasury note with zero risk. I will not lose anything, but I only get 3.45%. If I want average risk, I'll invest in the stock market and get 9.15%. But if I want general electric risk, I have to pay. I'm going to take, I assume that risk. I want to expect to get more of return. I'll get 10.352%. And that's the key to understanding risk in the market and how those strategies of running your company, finding the assets to invest to make sure those returns come forward into the future. It's all about financial management and corporate strategy. Okay, so that's our weekend update video for week number one. We've gone over what you all need to do this weekend. You need to finish up and wrap up your discussion one uh, bio and company selection and beta estimate uh, for week one. You need to select a date and time to meet with me in week two in the student discussion forum. And you need to read the article that I've posted in week one about chaotic markets. At the same time, review my discussion of understanding the definition of risk and return, especially in regards to the capital asset pricing model, which is a key indicator of investor risk and corporate risk strategy with investments. That about does it for this weekend. Enjoy your Easter weekend. Have a lovely Easter with your families. And I will see you all in week two on our Monday lecture video where we talk about some old friends. Standard um, <laughs> present value of money and stocks and bonds. Some old friends. Have a great weekend, everybody. And we'll see you on Monday, April 7th, April 10th. Until then, adios.